to understand after we learned about EPSP, who wants to remind me what EPSPs are, what do they stand for, but especially in your own words, what do they mean? Yes. <laughs> Excitatory postsynaptic potential, what does it mean? <laughs> Wonderful. It's a change in the membrane potential in the postsynaptic neuron, right? It's EPSP, postsynaptic potential. Uh, it's a local change, it's not an action potential, and excitatory, why? Because if we provide, generate an EPSP here, this is a resting membrane potential, and we generated an EPSP from a presynaptic neuron, let's say there's a presynaptic neuron right here, and we generated an EPSP, this will work towards exciting, stimulating the cell to generate an action potential where? Here, at the axon hilla. And if there will be enough EPSPs, and for that we need to sum up, to summate them, we talked about different ways to do that, then we will generate an action potential. But we have to have the great potential here, and they need to be strong enough, you know, for enough of these ions to move all the way to the axon P-lock to generate that EPSP. I left you last time with a question before we left, and that is, what about hyperpolarization? What happens if, let's say, a synapse right here, close to the axon HELOC, and I generate hyperpolarization? Can I do it, first of all? What are mechanisms by which I can hyperpolarize the axonal membrane, or the soma, or the dendrites? Any ideas? We talked about these when we learned about the fundamentals. Again, the question, maybe I'll give you time to discuss it with each other. The question is, how, molecularly wise, how can you hyperpolarize a membrane? Okay, so let's remind ourselves. So, the <laughs> classroom, what do you think? Suggest to me, I want to hear two ideas on how I can hyperpolarize a cell. What's your name? Potassium leaving. How can I make potassium leave? <laughs> There is already a concentration. I cannot control anything. We have a concentration. That's the resting membrane potential. How can I make more potassium leaf? And people can help. Diego. If I have, if I open using a neurotransmitter, a ligand gated channel that responds to that specific neurotransmitter, and that ligand gated channel is a potassium ligand gated channel, potassium will leave because potassium wants to leave. That depends on the gradient, right? And I just generated a hypopolarization. Back in the days, we talked about that when we talked about the resting and the greater payment potentials. Great. Another option? Yes? Um, uh, you can uh, have a ligand gate and channel uh, that allows um, uh, anions into the cell. Wonderful. Can you think about an anion? Uh, chloride. Chloride, for example. We have high concentration of chloride outside. If my neurotransmitter will open chloride ion channels, then chloride wants to get in, chloride will get in, chloride is negative charge, negative charge, I just hyperpolarize the cell. If we go close to the axon HELOC, and remember that the resting membrane potential here is negative 70, I just made it into a negative 80, for example. If I hyperpolarize the axon HELOC, will it be easier or more difficult for that specific axon HELOC and that specific neuron to reach the threshold, the negative 55? It's harder, right? So by hyperpolarizing the axon HELOC in the area, I am making it harder for the cell to reach that. So is that excitatory? What is it? Inhibitory. And that's the IPSP. This is an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. A local potential in the postsynaptic neuron that comes in response to the opening of Chloride channels, potassium channels, or both, they're not mutually exclusive. Any questions? Focused on depolarization, we should remind ourselves about hyperpolarization. Questions? I have a big question for you, more of like a big philosophical question. Why? What do we need it for? I mean, we can think about regulation, right? That will be the first thing maybe to think about. But I can already control 
I'm, I'm using, generating EPSPs, and I can not generate an EPSP. If I want to turn the switch, I want to turn the lights on. I can turn the switch on, so right, EPSP. But if I don't want to turn the lights on, I just want to keep it down or off, I can just decide not to turn the switch on. So why do I create an extra, another mechanism, which on one hand, I'm opening this, turning on the switch, but there's a whole different mechanism that turns off the switch. What do I gain from that? In nature, in evolution, not everything makes sense, but we typically do not see excess me mechanisms that need more energy, more work. It doesn't make sense. So talk with each other. Try to think yourself as the body. What do you gain from that if all you could do is just EPSP or no EPSP? or even not enough you please, please, okay? Let's think about it. Answer your learning pathetics. I'm not going to do everything, but of course, but maybe I want to give you a simple, simplified answer, and we'll think about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, okay? I like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, now, for the simplicity of it, let's imagine that all the activities I will do in order to eat a PB and J would be focused on one, all regulated by one neuron, right? Of course, it's much more than that. I need to hold it, I need to bring it to my mouth, I need to use my jaw muscles. But let's imagine that there's just one neuron responsible for all. There will be one neuron responsible for the outcome, outcome being I'm eating the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, okay? Now, in order for this neuron to fire, an actual potential, we use the fire as the verb, I need to generate not just even single, but multiple EPSPs, right, into that neuron. Now, you can think about the first example I gave you in the nervous system lecture when we talked about drinking water after running outside and sweating. We can apply it to this. Give me some ideas of some inputs that will generate EPSPs eventually in that neuron. What? You look at that. So what type of sensory inputs will make me want to even, or make me tell the, the neuron to tell the muscles to eat the sandwich. Anything, Isabel, yeah. Uh, visual, right? The sensory receptors, my rods and cones will see. If I don't see that, it's, I'll still take that some sensory inputs, but I see that, good, boom. One or maybe two EPSPs telling my neuron, hey, there's a peanut butter sandwich here, go and eat it, Damon. Smell. smell, right? I smell this, another sensory input. What else? Wonderful, right? I need to want to eat this peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? So I need to be hungry. Indeed, we have hunger. We have, we'll talk about the hypothalamus. We have hunger centers. So that will tell this neuron, okay, I'm hungry. So again, another EPSPs. We already had three EPSPs. Maybe that's enough. But there will be many others that are not involving right now sensory inputs, but are part of our memory, right? Hey, I remember yesterday I watched the TV, not really, but let's say, I saw this amazing commercial. People ate peanut butter and jelly sandwich from a very specific brand, never mind which, and all of them were so happy. And they all were so beautiful. Men, women, children, they were all celebrated just by eating peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I want to be like them, right? So here's another input for me to want that. I still remember my mom telling me about the first date with my dad, how they ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Great, I feel emotional about this. I want to eat that PB&J. ESP, EPSP, 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 we got enough. The next step, an outcome, firing an action potential, contracting the muscles, and I eat the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Then there's that one other memory that reminds me that when I was three years old, I ate peanuts, and I learned that I'm what? Yeah. Allergic to peanuts. And not really just for the sake of the story. Right? Now, do I want, really, my body wants to eat that sandwich? No way, right? There are many positive outcomes, but one extremely important negative outcomes that will overcome all the rest because that's a danger to my health. So it's not that one sensory input provided a number of EPSPs and then we need the IPSPs to contradict. We have different types of sensory inputs. And in this case, there is an IPSP that will be generated because of that negative sensory input 
that is more important than all the EPs pieced together. So it will need to win over that. So what we get with summation of EPSPs and IPSPs is basically we get all the information that we can to make the best choice, the most binary choice of firing an action potential or not. Okay? It's not just about one input. So if you look at a postsynaptic neuron, that's the neuron right here in brown, we see example of four different synapses, green, blue, black, red, where in this example, and in different places, soma, dendrite, etc., we will see an EPSP coming from this, maybe that came from the hunger part, a blue or purple one coming from the visual one, a smell one also provided an EPSP, but there was one in my example, again, very simplified, non-realistic example, it showed us that this is actually wrong, and we are going to send a neurotransmitter that opens a potassium or a chloride channel. And this is the IPSP. It's not only that the EPSP is summate, it's all of them summate. So yes, they will depolarize, this will depolarize, but if now we are not starting with negative 70, but maybe negative 80 because of this IPSP, those will not be sufficient to reach a threshold, and therefore this specific postsynaptic neuron with these specific out inputs will not fire an action potential. So IPSPs can summate with EPSPs, canceling each other out. Okay. And we'll typically find, not always, but we'll typically find those inhibitory synapses pretty much close to the axon HELOC. Why is that? Why is that important? Why do we expect to see that? Yes? You want a very small IPSP to be able to cancel out. Exactly. I want the IPSP to win when needed. Also, the impact of hypopolarization would be greater if I'm doing it really close to the axon HELOC. I'm basically changing the resting, not the resting state, but the, the opening, the starting state before the EPSP is of an effect. It's not that you won't find any IPSPs in other parts, but that's where we typically find them. In many cases in axo-axonic synapses, but when I say axo-axonic, it's still very close to the axon yolk. Any questions about IPSPs, why we have IPSPs, what's the idea here? Yes? It can be after, but it cannot necessarily be after. I mean, you go outside. Okay, and you tell yourself, oh, I no longer need to, to wear all these long sleeve clothes and everything. I came out of a meeting, I actually want to move to shorts, right? Because it's hot, because it's many, many things, right? But then suddenly it rains, or whatever happens, right? That's another input that will tell you maybe that's the wrong decision. The idea is kind of like a computer, or kind of like any control system. You provide all the possible inputs at the end to make the most, I would say, making sense type of an output. The output, please note, is always going to be binary. It's just one of two options, zero to one, like a computer. You either fire an action potential or you don't fire an action potential. But now I don't have just one input and one factor. I have four, five, or maybe a thousand. That's the difference. Anything else? Any other question? Yes. This will be used in any type of action that you do, all the time. When you're about to type your computer, you might type on this key, but then there will be an IPSP coming from your memory and from your practices, we'll talk about it today, that will say, wrong one, don't go there. It won't say go there, it just say, well, don't go there, and then as a result, you need to fix that. It's a combination of inputs, you know, yes. A wrong decision, great, so what if, right? What if for some reason I have a problem here? I don't have the right receptor, something is wrong with this neuron, then I will make the bad choices, exactly. I will not generate, I will, as we make bad choices, right? Because we won't have that input that is so important. Yes? So is it that uh, the IPSPs allow, like make it harder for that firing to occur that could still be overwhelmed if you had, say, like an 
the exactly. So I mean, it, it, think about how many times in our life, in our daily life, think about it about your life. How many times do we do something we know it's bad for us and we do it, right? How many of us open the refrigerator and say, I do not need to eat this specific thing? <laughs> yeah, my cake that I ate yesterday at 11 p.m., I did not want to eat it. Still, my brain made a very valid, logical decision based on, in this case, too many PSPs. Yeah. Um, I guess we kind of like a brain potential against PSP, but like in the opposite direction. Yes, all of them are local potentials, exactly. All of them are changes in local potentials. So I sh showed you here a diagram with four synapses, right? One, two, three, four. But actually, in reality, it can be much more than that, right? Who drew this? Kahal, right? The one that we show, the one who discovered the neurons, right? These are cells called Purkinje cells. Should be called Purkinje cells, but they call it here Purkinje cells. This is the cell body next to the letter A. This is the axon. These are dendrites. Each spike that you see here is a synapse. So it can be hundreds, dozens and dozens, and sometimes hundreds and sometimes even more inputs. Again, at the end of the day, there will be only yes or no, zero or one, a binary decision, firing the function potential and not. The more input we bring in, the better decision we can make. That's the idea. OK, and I just want to show you, this is Kahal. I just want to show you what we can, how we can see dendrites and cells today. This is a technique that is pretty recent from five years ago or so. It's called Brainbow for brain and rainbow. And the idea is that you can color each and every neuron separately. And as a result, you can see junctions. This is part of the hippocampus. And you can see the cell body. And you can see all the dendrites. You cannot really, of course, detect anything here. But just to show you how rich those trees are, the dendrites and how many synapses can be involved here. Okay? Now we need to put into, we need to consider also the fact that when we talk about multiple types of synapses, there are also multiple types of neurotransmitters we can play with, right? So I will say, first of all, you do not need, I put that on the GRQ, but you do not need to remember the different neurotransmitters for the sake of this lecture. Okay? These are just some of the major, most common and famous uh, neurotransmitters, uh, different chemicals, some are even gases like nitric oxide. Uh, but the idea is that we have so many. Now, is, are they excitatory, inhibitory, either, can be both? There are tools that we use, right? So some of them tend to be more excitatory than others. And others can be more inhibitory than others, but it's almost never a single case. So what will determine, I'll give you an example. Acetylcholine, I'll, give, I'll write the example later on, but I want to introduce it already. Acetylcholine, we mentioned, right? In that synapse with the skeletal muscle is what? Inhibitory or excitatory? Excitatory, it opens which type of channels? Sodium, we talked about acetylcholine, right? In the heart, on the other hand, in the heart muscle, we will talk about the heart much later in the semester, it's going to open potassium and chloride channels, which means it's inhibitory. It's the same neurotransmitter. It's the same molecule. It doesn't get different names. The same one. So how come it inhibits in the heart and promotes, stimulates in the skeletal muscles? What's different between those parts? It's the receptors. Remember, these are ligand-gated channels. They have two levels of specificity, one for the ion, one for the ligand. So I can have a sodium acetylcholine-gated channel found in the skeletal muscle, but in the heart, I won't find it. On the other hand, I will find a chloride or potassium acetylcholine-ligand-gated channel. So we have a combination of neurotransmitters, a combination of receptors, all of them give an huge number of synapses, all of them give us so many opportunities to provide an input. Okay, this is the glutamate receptor, for example, and you can see the GFP is the one showing that this is a dendrite, or part of a dendrite, of course, even orange, reddish, 
And all the greens are the blue limit receptor. Not each one is a synapse. A synapse will have more than one receptor, but you can see how many of them. This is just the end of one of the dendrites. Just so many. And this is what I just discussed. Neurotransmitters are commonly classified as excitatory inhibitory. There's a general rule for many of them, but it's just a general rule. Okay? Glutamate, for example, is typically excitatory, but in the eyes, it's inhibitory. Classification is useful, but not precise. I gave you just an example of facility calling that can be excitatory in the skeletal muscles, but inhibitory in the heart. And again, it's the type of receptor. That's the most important factor that will determine whether we're going to see hyper or depolarization. It depends, of course, on the neurotransmitter, because that serves as the ligand. But which specific receptor that is, that's going to be a key. Next week, when you will learn about the autonomic nervous system, mostly, in this case, it will be mostly readings, you will talk about different receptors, and you will see the different receptors that respond, for example, to a sitting column. Any questions about everything we discussed so far? Yes, inhibitory synopsis. No, the main idea is, just to repeat, is that we want the inhibitory ones to have a really strong effect because they have the alarming one, right? They are the ones to say, stop, you are allergic to peanuts, don't eat them. It doesn't mean that we cannot overcome them with enough, we're just increasing the number of EPSPs, but we want their impact to be pretty direct and quick. This is why we would expect to find many of them very close to the axon pillow. Again, we'll find them in other places, but that's what we typically would expect. Before we move to the brain, the last thing I want to mention about the synapses is that we talk about the fact that one synapse will generate right, an EPSP, and in one synapse will be more stimulatory, and another one will be inhibitory, etc., based on many things, but mainly about the type of receptor. Now, when we are embryos, fetuses, our brain develops. It's a very dynamic process. And as we are born, it continues to develop. But at this some point, we have a network, right? A network of synapses and neurons. And those are basically how we make decisions. Again, because of all the inputs and the memories that we just discussed, and what we visualize and listen and hear, etc., etc. Are we done with that network? Is this a static network at some point? Or is that continuing as we are adults? What do you think? You are now sitting in this class, writing, typing, thinking. What are you doing? How do we call this learning, right? What is that learning? What does it mean when you say learning? What does it mean in very materialistic, physical terms? You guys are now, yes, you go, sorry. You're making new connections. What you're working now is in your networks, on your synapses. These are the stars of the decision making. And when we talk about synapses, when we talk about our life, we have to say a word about synaptic plasticity. Synapses are plastic. We have more plasticity in our younger age than we have when we are adults. I have less plasticity than you guys because I'm older. And 20 years from now, if I make it, it will be less. But it's still dynamic. When we talk about synaptic plasticity, we can dedicate a whole semester to synaptic plasticity, to what we know, and two semesters what we don't know, because it's really so complex and, and fascinating. But I still just want to address this. When we talk about synaptic plasticity, we talk about two levels of plasticity. A physical one, where synapses can be built or destroyed. And we also talk about functional ones. So we'll talk about the functional in a second. I want to give you an example of a physical one. So what you see here in this experiment, the red is a marker for an axon, the axon terminal. And the green is a marker of a protein. It's a GFP, green fluorescent protein, attached to a protein that is found in dendrites and is found in synapses. It's one of the synaptic proteins. Right now, you see red here and green here because there's no physical attachment. 
But what we see, what we're going to see, we're going to see a growth of the axon because axons are dynamic and binding to the dendrites. And what I wanted to note is how some of these green pixels, which are real GFPs, are going to move on up to the axon. They're going to make eventually synapses. Okay? So you can see the touch. And now you'll start to see some. Can you see the green dots going up like this one? Okay? What we see is the beginning of a buildup of a synapse. Now, if we fire a lot, through a given synapse, that means that this synapse works, right? It gets information, it gets the right input because we do that all the time. And that synapse is gonna be stable. But if a synapse does not get a lot of firing because we use to use a network, let's say from cell A to cell B and C and from there to ENF, compared to a different network from cell A to cell D and from there to G and I. And if we see that the latter one is much better and we get better outcomes, we'll continue to fire from that one. And if the first one, the A to B and C and from C to E and F, just didn't give us the right output, we'll stop firing there, right? we we'll generate more IP space and we'll say it doesn't work. So the more it continues, basically, sometimes, not always, these synapses will be degenerated, basically. They will be physically destroyed because we don't need them. Sometimes they will be there because we need them a little bit, but even that's a physical level, we can have a functional level, for example, when a synapse will just work better the next time action potential runs through that synapse. How can you do it molecularly? Give me an example. Think about one thing. How can I make a synapse work better? Yes? Maybe I it just increase as a feedback that synaptic interaction. When I generated DPSPs and fired an action potential, that led to a good outcome, right? peanut butter and jelly, it was tasty, and I did not get allergy. That's good. I want to do it next time. I'll fire again and again and again. Next time, maybe the cell will increase the concentration of receptors, which means the action potential will run even faster. The decision will be made in a fast, quick way. Okay? That's what we call synaptic plasticity. By the way, just a, a short story. Uh, years ago, I don't remember when, one of the students who took this class did an honest project about this class. He was a computer science and biology double major. And what he did, this is basically, for those who know something about computers, this is what we call machine learning in computers, basically, how machines teach themselves. And what he did is to take a very simple network of neurons, three neurons, that's it, or oh, sorry, three synapses. So very, very simple, though. And he provided input. And what he used as inputs, what he looked is for the basketball game, the college basketball games. What it is is just provide tons of inputs, height of the players, the number of, I don't know, scores that they shoot, each one of them, whatever it is, right? All of these, and just put it to the computer. And let the computer teach itself. And the computer started to build scenarios, and then based on the results, the actual results during the season, it says, okay, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this works better, and so on. There were hundreds and hundreds of options there. And eventually it created one that was the best one in evolution of the machine learning. And then what he had is like, okay, when I'm saying the, the option, the, op the option was a scenario. This synapse will provide, this neuron will provide an IPSP, this one will be EPSP, and this will diverge, etc., etc. And he tested his winner, basically, in the tournament. And he got the 95th percentile in predictions of the tournament. The NCAA, it's pretty amazing. This is all machine learning, right? It's not anything to do with, oh, we think this team is better than the other. So that's the idea. This is how our brain works with machine learning. I use the word brain, so let's move on. OK. Before we say a word about the brain, just for those of you who are not tired of neurobiology at this point, uh, first of all, many of you are taking neuroscience classes. We have classes in neuroscience department. But I also want to mention, highlight two classes in biology if you're interested. 450 is Introduction to Neurobiology. It's basically taking what you learned in neurophysiology, the basic physiology, neurophysiology, and just go much, much more deeper and in an advanced way. 455 talks about behavioral neuroscience, uh, pathologies in neuroscience, etc. So just check them out if you're interested as upper level classes in biology. This is a brain. Whose brain is that? Anyone? Can you tell just by looking? Can anyone tell? 
This is the guy. For those who are not familiar with the story, I don't have time to, say, to tell the story, Google that story. It's really interesting how they try to steal Albert Einstein's brain to study. It's a very interesting one. No, he did not give permission. But not all people do what they're supposed to do. Uh, so let's talk about the brain. And we're going to, I told you that in the class, we're going to emphasize more physiology rather than anatomy. But when it comes to the brain, we're going to talk physiology, almost only physiology. In the lab, you have the brain stuff. I will not ask you about what you study in the lab. I will ask you about the lecture. Uh, this is the basic parts of the brain, we will focus mainly on the cerebrum and mainly on the cerebral cortex in the cerebrum. Not just, but mainly on the cerebral cortex. That's what we're going to talk about today and half at least of Tuesday. Okay, we'll talk about the other parts, some more, some less, but that's going to be the emphasis. And that's the major part, of course, of the brain. So we're going to focus not only on the brain, but first of all on the cerebral cortex. From now until the end of today and until mid-Tuesday, it's all cerebral cortex. Before we start to introduce the different parts and regions, two take-home messages that it's important to me to convey and for you to remember. First of all, a term that we always need to remember that it exists there, a phenomenon that is called contralaterality. Our, we have a right and left hemisphere. A right hemisphere is responsible for the left side of our body. A left hemisphere is responsible for the right side of the body. I can pretty much guess that most of you, before you were students at UNC Chapel Hill, you've heard about it, even if you did not take biology in high school. It's pretty familiar. But what many people do not know, so it's important that we know this, is that we're not just talking about the motor output function. It's not only that my right hemisphere is telling my left hand muscles right now to contract, but it's also about the sensory. Okay. So it's working in both ways. Right now, I'm touching with my left fingers. I'm touching the podium. That means that a signal goes from here, synapses with neurons in my spinal cord. They will go all the way up, synapse again in the brain, in the lower parts of the brain, and then go to my cerebral cortex. To which hemisphere? It's my left hand to the right hemisphere. Where exactly? We'll talk about that today. And questions about contralaterality. It has nothing to do with different parts of the left are responsible for some functions and different parts of the right are responsible. We'll talk about that next week, but that's going to around. The second thing is kind of something that I already said to you about this class, right? I told you, basically, we're talking about the simplicity. We talk about the basic rules. There are exceptions to the rules. When I talk about the brain, I have to emphasize this. Everything that I'm going to tell you is wrong. Okay, everything I'm telling you today and next Tuesday is going to be wrong. Okay, I'm still going to ask you questions about the exam, and I'm still going to grade you on that. Okay, but we have to understand that, yes, in order to learn about the brain, we have to first understand the simplified version. But when I will say this region in the cortex is responsible for function A, that's wrong, because any function A will involve basically almost any part of the cerebral cortex. Maybe not all, but almost all. It is true that some parts will be mainly focused on a specific function. So I'm not going to lie in that sense, but please remember it's so much more complicated than that, even at the level that we know, let alone what we don't know. And we really don't know anything about the brain at this point. We know so much, but we don't know anything. OK. So now I give myself all the excuses. I can just talk BS for the rest of today's class. OK. What we're going to focus today is only about the first objective to characterize the motor and sensory functional regions of the brain. That's what we're going to do today. We'll talk about it the other way. So as anatomists and physiologists, we like to classify things and to put them into subgroups and sub-subgroups. So let's start with that. We talk about motor areas, sensory areas, and what we will discuss on Tuesday, multimodal association areas. These are areas that also involve sensory inputs but not just one type of input, not just hearing or visual input, but multiple inputs. And we'll give two examples for those, model, uh, for those areas next week. Okay, we're gonna start with the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. I'm starting actually with the anatomy, but just to orient you. Again, 
I don't want to say I don't care, but for the sake of this class and for the sake of your exam, I don't care you knowing the, this gyrus and that sulcus. Okay, this is for the lab. So this is a simple sulcus. Okay, and here's the frontal lobe, and we're going to the anterior part, and we see one gyrus labeled here in red. That is the precentral gyrus. This is just to orient you. What we care is about the physiological function and the physiological term and name of that region. So that's what you really need to know. And we call this the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex is a whole gyrus filled with cell bodies. The axons will go different ways, but it's all filled with cell bodies. How do we call this matter? Is it gray or white? Gray, anyone wants to remind me why? The initial bodies, exactly. There are lots of cell bodies over there. <coughs> and stop me if I'm running too fast. Okay, so that's the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex consists of cell bodies, of neurons, that will eventually, not directly, but eventually lead to contraction of our skeletal muscles. In a very generalized term, we use, tend to say that they will allow the conscious control, conscience, aware, control of voluntary movements. As I mentioned once, answering the question in this class, in one of the discussions, I don't like the term voluntarily because we don't always think that what we do is voluntary when it might be even voluntary. But we can just think about them as the ones controlling the skeletal muscles. Okay? These are the neurons. We have many, many neurons. And again, with the disclaimer that it's not exactly accurate, but it is true in general, different parts of the primary motor cortex, we have many different neurons that will stimulate or innervate and control different, not necessarily stimulate, but control different body parts. Okay? So we have some sort of map map of the body parts, but not the real body parts, but how they are reflected and regulated in our cerebral cortex, and specifically in the primary motor cortex. So this region right here is responsible for the muscles of our feet, and this region right here is responsible for the muscles that move our eyes, okay? It's not the pupils, it's the eyes that we move them to the left, right, up, down, etc. Okay? We call this map somatotopy. And we can see our map better if we, so first of all, the primary motor cortex is composed of neurons that control eventually, it's not directly, they synapse with other neurons, but eventually the targets, the effectors, will be different skeletal muscles. Okay, and as I mentioned, the skeletal muscles of the body can be mapped according to the location of their stimulating, controlling neurons. So now when we look at that, we can imagine ourselves making a frontal lobe section right here and rotating it, and now we'll be able to see the map better. And what we see in this somatotopy diagram, the white matter is what looks like a yellow matter here. Okay, these are what do, what do I have here more than anything else in the white matter? Axons. And so why are they white? Myelin sheet. Wonderful. The red represents the gray cortex. It's not really a red cortex, but that's what we have in the diagram. And the body parts or the muscles that 